Good afternoon. My name is Kate Tallman and I serve on AAM's Environment and Climate Network. We're thrilled that you could join us today for our kickoff event for Earth Month 2023. If you were able to join us last year, you'll know that in the weeks leading up to Earth Day, we'd like to host one webinar a week looking at sustainability in the museum field. This year, we really wanted to focus on the specific challenges and successes that historic house museums and sites um, have had in the midst of the climate crisis. Before we get started, I would like to invite you to join us for our next two events on the 12th and 18th of this month. I will put the digital flyer in the chat, so please feel free to take a look at those and we hope that you will join us. We have some wonderful speakers from the Whitney Plantation, the Henry Ford Museum Complex, the Strawberry Bank Museum, Preservation Strategies, and the Mark Twain House. At the end of today's session, we will have time for a Q&A portion, so if you find uh, yourself asking questions during the presentations, we ask that you place them into the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. This will allow us to track your questions and ensure that they get answered. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Julie Bly Devere. She's the co-chair of AAM's Historic Houses and Sites Network and our moderator for today's event. Good morning uh, on the West Coast and good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Kate and the AAM Environment and Climate Network. Um, I am Julie Bly Devere, one of the co-chairs of the AAM Historic House and Site Network. And I've spent most of my time at Historic Homes. And so I'm really excited to hear from our panelists today. And we're looking forward to this whole series. So thank you for working with us um, to make this happen. Our first panelists are representing the Signor Burlada House in New Orleans. And our panelists um, in this first one will be Daniel Hammer, the president and CEO, and Michael Cohn, the CFO and project manager. And they'll be speaking to us today about their journey to get their LEED certification in the, their historic home and the future of climate resiliency and what that means during their renovation project and how they're really fighting the challenges that come from um, increasing climate change in the New Orleans. So we're really excited to have you join us today. Thank you um, so much, Julie, um, and uh, thank you for having us. We're looking forward to being here and uh, appreciate uh, the Climate Network for putting this together and to everybody in the audience for, for joining us today. So um, Michael and I are with the Historic New Orleans Collection. We're a museum research center and publisher in New Orleans, located in the French Quarter. Uh, our um, major, main museum facility is called the Signore Brulatour House. Uh, and this is a building which we opened in 2019 after an extensive renovation of the historic uh, buildings on the site, uh, which uh, date to 1816 and are some of the oldest buildings in the French Quarter, and also includes a purpose-built uh, um, exhibition center portion, a new construction um, uh, adjacent to it. So if you look on this picture here, which shows all of our buildings in the French Quarter, uh, the kind of dark orange buildings in the middle uh, that's the Signore Brulatour house, the footprint of it. Um, we'll be sharing some links in uh, the chat uh, that will um, provide a little bit of information and a few different examples of ways that we share information about our projects. Uh, one of them is a link to an internal, um, uh, well, first of all, one of them is a link to a quarterly magazine article about the Signore Brulatour project from 2019 when we completed it. Uh, that we um, shared with our uh, members. Um, another is a link to a letter on our website from me, which uh, just is kind of a general public message about our upcoming renovation of other buildings in our, um, in our institution, our original buildings located at 533 Royal Street. And then um, an article from our internal newsletter for our staff uh, answering some frequently asked questions about that upcoming renovation project. So uh, let's see if you can go to the um, uh, the next slide, Kate.
Yeah, so um, our institution was founded, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So our institution was founded by two individuals, Kemper Williams and Leela Williams. You see them here at the top right of this slide. They were um, preservationists who purchased the buildings that you see in the bottom right. Uh, those are buildings are part of the buildings that they purchased in 1938 um, in order to move into them and, and live in them. Um, this was a time when the French Quarter was generally not thought of by the Williamses and their peers as being of much value, except for the purpose of uh, basically uh, tearing it down to make something new. Uh, the Williamses, however, didn't feel that way. And they were among a relatively small population of people who thought that the French Quarter was of value because of its uh, history, its historic identity, and its romantic uh, uh, um, sense, its uh, its aesthetic and its historic value. And so they bought these buildings in order to live in them. And from uh, 1946, after the war, when they moved in until 1964, when they left because of Mrs. Williams's health, they hosted uh, four to five dinner parties a week and invited dozens of people to each party to basically enjoy the French Quarter for what they thought it was, um, which was interesting and, and beautiful. And over the course of that mid 20th century period, as they were doing this, uh, and there were some other people like them doing things like this, uh, New Orleans experienced a, a, a huge change in terms of how it presented itself to the world. And it began to become what the tourism industry in New Orleans started coining America's most interesting city, as you can see from this poster from our collection, which dates to 1960. And so the Williams's preservation activities uh, of the first half of the 20th century really led to the development of um, New Orleans as a tourism destination um, uh, of to a much greater extent than it had been in its previous history um, through the mid portion of the 20th century. Um, and then uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Kate. Um, of course, today, that industry is our city's single industry. The root, all other industries in the city have, uh, you know, for one reason or another, um, uh, declined in, um, in importance, while the tourism industry has, has increased in importance. And so uh, this is a website. This is the Independent, uh, an article from the Independent from 2019, um, um, noting that the number of visitors to New Orleans that year was greater than the number of visitors to Venice, and drawing attention to uh, issues of, um, you know, that we use the term sustainable tourism, but what it basically gets down to is the extent to which the tourism industry was actually um, causing uh, deterioration as it, and not preservation of historic value and cultural value. And so the Williams's preservation efforts were all about raising interest in the French Quarter for the sake of preserving it. But uh, now we have to contend with how to use the French Quarter for the sake of preserving it because the interest is there. There's no need to convince anybody that the French Quarter is interesting anymore. It's rather we need to understand how to, um, how to engage people with the French Quarter in a way that helps to um, sustain its historic and cultural value. And so for us now, uh, historic preservation, while it is certainly about architecture and aesthetic things, it's very much about cultural preservation. And in South Louisiana, which is also uh, one of the world's most threatened environments uh, due to climate change, cultural preservation and um, environmental preservation are inexorably linked together. There is no separation of them. And so for this reason, uh, sustainable building must be linked to historic preservation for us. As we pursue the preservation of our historic buildings, we must also pursue their um, sustainability. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in 2014, we commenced a major renovation of this building, which is directly across the street from uh, our original buildings. Um, for the purpose of expanding our exhibition space so that we could uh, begin to accommodate larger audiences, uh, recognizing that if we're not able to engage more people, we will not be able to have an impact of significance 
on our environment, which sees so many, uh, literally tens of millions of visitors a year. Um, and so this project was a historic preservation project. The building at the top is a, built originally in 1816, and we pursued the preservation of its historic fabric uh, in all cases. We were able to uh, um, cash in on, on tax credits as a result of that, we were, meaning we were successful with our preservation efforts. Uh, but we also built uh, on a portion of the site which had no contributing buildings on it previous to our starting the project, we were able to build a, a new construction facility that gave us an opportunity to create larger exhibition volumes and uh, build something that could accommodate more visitors. Uh, and all these things together, this project we were able to achieve a LEED Silver certification on. And so Michael will uh, go into more detail about, about that and what that looked like. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, but I, I am happy to say that uh, we've been um, quite successful with our effort to engage more people, although we still have a very, very long way to go. Uh, and, but uh, we recently had an exhibition on view in our new exhibition facility uh, about Notre Dame Cathedral, and it was very, very popular. And in fact, uh, I'd like to share this image that shows that it was sold out. Um, because we are a free museum, we don't charge admission, but uh, because this exhibit was so popular, uh, people really needed to get reservations in advance. We were um, you know, unable to accept many walk-in visitors because of the high interest in the exhibition. And so in the final weekend, we actually ended up uh, selling out completely. And we posted this uh, item on Facebook where it says sold out. And some of the comments people were uh, offering to sell tickets at... Uh, uh, below the, the purchase price, which uh, of course was free. So I thought that was funny. A colleague said that we were the Taylor Swift of museums, um, at least for that one day. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and so we're now in the process of commencing a, another renovation uh, and restoration project. And it is the restoration of our original buildings, the buildings purchased by the Williamses in 1938 that were for so long the, uh, the entirety of our museum. And uh, this project will be a uh, major undertaking that will take uh, the next few years to complete. But the goal of the project is not just to restore the historic fabric and to make it more conducive or, or to increase its uh, conducivity for the um, housing of our historic collections, but it's also to do things that are just as critical to our success of our preservation mission when you think about the importance of use, such as um, creating um, uh, energy efficiency, um, dealing with water management, and uh, creating more accessibility, again, so that we can, um, so that we can welcome uh, more audience and have a greater impact on how the French Quarter is perceived and used. And so a lot of these things, uh, sustainability and accessibility are often in conflict with historic preservation as thought of traditionally, and these conflicts are the things that we'll have to navigate through the course of this project. Um, I put also here a logo of a group called the French Quarter Museum Association. And this is just to um, underscore the importance of the fact that we as an institution, could, single institution, couldn't possibly have the impact that needs to be had on our own because the size of the, um, of the audience is too large. Uh, in a historic place, in a, in a tourism district like, uh, in a tourism city like the uh, like New Orleans, in order to um, achieve uh, impactful um, presence for history and culture in the landscape of that city, uh, not one single institution can do it. And so the French Quarter has a number of museums, nonprofit museums, most of which are house museums, and we all work together to um, increase the extent to which people understand the French Quarter as a place to visit museums. Um, and so that is, uh, that's it for my kind of introduction. I'll now turn it over to Michael to talk about the, um, the 520 Royal Street renova renovation, the Signore Rulator House, and how we achieved both our historic preservation goals as well as our sustainable building goals. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel. Um, if you could go to the next page, please, Kate. Oh, this is simply an introduction page to my material. <laughs> the first thing I want to talk about really are the challenges <clears throat> that we had with LEED. Uh, we, early on in our project, 
knew that we wanted to uh, seek LEED certification. I'll say that our original hopes were we could get a uh, standard certification, and we were able actually to get um, silver certification. But there's some challenges, and Daniel mentioned one a moment ago, is the conflict between historic uh, restoration and also you know, preservation of, um, of uh, environmental preservation. So we had a building that was, in, in essence, 200 years old. There was a piece uh, in the middle that was not historic. That's uh, the one you saw earlier, um, of the more modern uh, museum. But uh, you know, dealing with a 200-year-old building, there were many things that had to be done to make it uh, usable, safe, um, and of course, meet current code, and in our attempts to uh, get our LEED certification. We were, almost, we were also limited by space. Um, the building itself takes approximately one third of the city block, and the construction was in the city block center. Uh, so the, the challenges there were what, what we could actually do in that space and still make it happen. Um, of course, there's always regulatory issues. Um, we have uh, here in the French Quarter the Bucure Commission. They're responsible for a historic uh, you know, look and feel of the entire French Quarter. Uh, which includes all portions of the buildings, which you see I put in quotes here, touch air. It's a very simple way to look at uh, what uh, they have uh, governance over. Um, we also have the State Historic Preservation Office. Daniel mentioned a moment ago that we were able to qualify for state historic tax credits of up to 18% of our qualifying expenses, but we had to meet their requirements as well. Um, these entities, they do have some control about what you can and cannot do, uh, especially on the outside of the building. Um, uh, SHPO is on the inside as well. Uh, for example, uh, there's height restrictions in the French Quarter of 50 feet. You cannot build beyond that. Um, also, what type and construction of doors, windows, and roofing, and other material. Um, and of course, they get to define to a certain extent what is and what is not historic. Um, the city has its own regulations, um, and uh, we have to work within their code as well. Uh, water management is one that uh, mentioned now, but uh, we got we really got ahead of um, our architects designed a system for uh, the water that was shed off the roofs that uh, would meet the city code that had not yet actually uh, been approved. And um, so now we have. Uh, water tanks of approximately, I'd say 50 or 55,000 gallons that collect the water that come off the roofs before it runs down into the city's uh, water systems. Um, the use of construction equipment in the French Quarter also, you're limited by what can fit in the French Quarter, what the city will allow. Um, street closures again for construction and no, noise ordinances. So uh, all of those things were things we had to deal with uh, at the same time as trying to meet our, uh, our I guess our lead uh, requirements. Kate, on the next screen, please. Okay, I know Daniel sh showed a picture like this. It's a similar picture. This is the completed uh, facade, front facade of 520 Royal. And, um, you know, I think uh, you, I want to show you here is clearly, uh, it's, uh, like he mentioned, early 19th century. This building, uh, and there's two wings behind it that I'll show you in a moment are uh, all from that time and equal approximately 18,000 square feet. You can see that it is within buildings on both sides. The building on the right is um, actually a hotel. So it's um, it's a challenge for us from that perspective. And in fact, I mean, most would, be, would not be surprised to know that we couldn't really do any construction through the front of the building because of Royal Street there, with the exception of the, the facade. Okay, next screen, Kate. Uh, this is a similar picture, I think, that Daniel showed a bird's eye view of uh, 420 Royal, and it represents that uh, situation, the challenge I described, uh, where it's, you know, it's basically jammed into the middle of a block. Um, I will also tell you, you can see the, the part that's highlighted in red is our project. Um, the buildings that are just to its left and a little bit down are also um, properties owned by the historic New Orleans collection. Um, however, that didn't do us any favors when it came to the construction of the building. So, um, you know, the, it just combined those challenges. I also want to point out, it's kind of hard to see here, but this is one of the, the challenges I mentioned before. Um, in order to get an air conditioning system that would meet the entire building's requirements, uh, requirements for a museum, uh, requirements for LEED, uh, we had to install a chiller system that was 
on the roof of the new building you described earlier. Um, and in fact, it wouldn't couldn't go on the roof because we would have gone below or above the 80, I'm sorry, 50 feet. So in fact, what we did is we had a well built uh, on the fourth floor of that building. So all of the chiller systems are actually just below the roof. Um, and so we were, we had to certainly there give up some space inside the building so that we could have um, a mechanical system that met all the requirements. Okay, next one. So here's a picture of uh, the original building on the left-hand side. And uh, this is the courtyard. This is the center of the building, the building's activities for, you know, since it's since, uh, original construction. Um, and the point I want to make here is uh, the building on the right-hand side, you see the bricks. That was actually, um, we'll go to that in a moment, but that's a, a building that was not historic. It was constructed by previous owner and it was less than 50 uh, years old. And that would, that's what gave us the opportunity to build that purpose-built exhibition space. And also, which I'll get to in a moment, also helped us to get our LEED certification. Um, you can see all these windows uh, and doors that are there. They had to come back basically the way they um, way they were, just restored. And of course, that's a challenge for energy efficiency. So uh, next, next uh, screen. This is the same uh, courtyard. It's been completed here. <laughs> it's, I think it's obvious it's been completed. Um, but uh, I want to point out here that you can see the original construction of the windows and the doors that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the, uh, the challenges that that created for us as well. Um, and they were going to be they were required by everybody um, except for lead. So that was where we um, weren't able to get some points. Um, we were able to get our historic tax credits. So um, next next one. This is a uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is the uh, wing opposite the one you just saw. Uh, the hotel is in the background there, and this is the um, uh, we I think. We're arguably the oldest portion portions of the building that is standing. Um, and uh, what's important here is, of course, you can see, it's hard to tell, but you see these bricks are old, they're original bricks, soft bricks. And also, if you see right above the windows on the first floor, uh, there's a, a small ledge. And that ledge reflects an addition of uh, bricks to the building to help it to help it hold hold itself up. But those bricks, are only there uh, three bricks wide, uh, and the second floor are only two bricks wide. So uh, there's a structural challenge there as well as an environmental challenge there. And of course, we did have to bring it back the same way. Okay, next one. Okay, this is uh, what we call the wine warehouse. It was This picture is not of a wine warehouse. This is a picture of offices that were built by a previous owner. It was one of the TV stations here in town. Um, and this was not historic. We were able to take this down. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, you can see this facade is false. It's just one, one layer of bricks there, um, demonstrating uh, you know, the, uh, the intent at the time to make it look like the rest of the building, uh, which, we took, which we took down. Um, okay, next one. This is um, a picture of the new construction from above. This is from the hotel next door. Um, you can see that mechanical well, almost right in the center of the picture that I talked about earlier, was used to help keep the uh, project under the 50 feet, like I mentioned. And it was also able to help with uh, uh, um, basically all of the other related mechanicals. Um, electrical was all within the building. Also, the electrical was uh, in underneath. You see there's a roof to the right there with a monitor on top. That's uh, actually a garage, but uh, we took some of that space to put mostly electrical service in, which was a major benefit for us. And we were also able to design it the way we needed. Um, um, so the next, uh, the next screen shows you uh, the first page of our LEED uh, certification. And you can see I've highlighted some items too. It's not really easy to read, but uh, the point I wanted to make here is you can see where from here, where we were able to pick up our points. Um, some of these are a small number of points, one or two. But the highlighted ones are important uh, in our success. Those one, two, three, four, those five lines that you see there got us 40% um, of the points we needed to get silver certified. And uh, what's important is that we were able to do this. I'm just talk a little bit about this here. We were able to do this because of the new construction. I think most folks who dealt with lead or historic uh, renovations will understand this. 
uh, because it's basically impossible to get them otherwise. Um, but we were able to, to do a lot of things that we needed, as you can see, and also knock out you know, almost half of the points required. Um, and I think that uh, that's part of, uh, part of the process. But this in itself, I would say, is part of the process for LEAD. And I want to add to this that um, LEAD is a well-established and uh, well-supported system for uh, you know, environmental certification. Um, but the truth is that there are other things that can be done that wouldn't necessarily fall under LEAD, but you can still apply to your uh, renovation depending on what type it is and where you have it. Um, uh, Daniel mentioned uh, our 533 renovation, which we haven't quite started, but we're planning on. And our goal there is, again, to get a LEED certification, but our goal is to go beyond that and to find the um, environmental uh, solutions that we can put into this building that um, also stand as a representation for what can succeed in the French Quarter uh, and in historic museums for um, historic restoration slash environmental, uh, I guess, uh, you know, certifications. Uh, so the next screen, please. So what have we done or what can you do to also promote LEAD? Um, you can see there, we are on the far on the right, we have uh, a picture of our LEAD solar certification that we recently put on the building. I think Daniel and I are both very proud of that since we work so hard for it. Um, but you can install this plaque. Uh, or other plaques. Uh, LEAD has a lot of options. Um, you can put out a press release, which we also have done. Um, promoting uh, the LEAD certification and its importance to our stakeholders, which are our members, our donors, our employees, uh, the community, in our case, uh, the French Quarter, the city. Um, use social media to promote it. Um, uh, another one I think is important is uh, partnering with others who value sustainable building. And I think also that our, by our doing this and promoting it, it'll help us to find those partners uh, and get more of them. Like Daniel mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, French Quarter Museum Association is a way that we can do that because we can't simply do it on our own. Um, and then the last bullet is uh, focus on the benefits and the characteristics of your project. I think I've gone over some of ours here, um, and it's not just what it's not just what gets you the lead certifications. It's things like I mentioned that also help to promote, um, you know, in more environmentally friendly buildings, and uh, bring people in to uh, understand that and work with them. So I just went back and forth between those two bullets, but um, that is uh, that is the extent of uh, my material. So. Well, thank you both. What a great project, Michael and Daniel. <clears throat> I know I really enjoyed seeing um, your site in 2019 when I was there last. Um, it really was beautiful. And I'm clearly, I'll have a new reason to go back when you're done with upcoming projects as well. I know we have quite a few questions that are in the chat, um, not in the chat, in the Q&A widget. So uh, we'll get to those after our second speaker. Um, and if you can continue to put those questions in the widget there, we'll make sure to get to them. Um, our next panelist is Becky Bollier and president and CEO of the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati, Ohio. She's also a past chair of the AAM Historic House and Site Network. So I'm happy to introduce her. And today Becky's gonna share some of her greening efforts that she's been part of both at the Taft and at her prior museum, the Florence Griswold Museum. All right, thanks so much, Julie. And I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Hold on one second. All right, um, so I'm gonna take a little bit different perspective from Michael and Daniel. Um, obviously they are founts of knowledge when it comes to some of the technical specificities. And I think a lot of the uh, lead compliance questions that I see are popping up. Um, I am not a professional with a background in environmental sustainability or lead compliance. I am a museum worker um, who's undertaken a number of these projects. So I thought what I would do today 
today is to introduce myself and to point out um, some of the strengths and opportunities with undergoing such projects in different environments. So here's me. Hello, my name is Becky. I may have met some of you before. Um, I am thrilled to be here today. As Julie said, I am now currently the director uh, of the Taft Museum of Art, which is in Cincinnati and previously served in that role at the Florence Griswold Museum in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Um, so the Florence Griswold Museum is where we'll start today. Um, and the site itself has expanded and we'll talk a little bit about that, but it originated with one acre um, which housed this building, which is an 1820 uh, Georgian structure. Uh, the museum opened to the public in 1974, and it really just opened with this building. And since that time, we've explored a number of different expansion opportunities, such as the construction of the Creeble Galleries, which took place in 2003. As you can see, this is indicative of a larger property amalgamation in which we were able to assemble the original acreage of the site which was really exciting for everybody at the museum. So we took ourselves from that original one acre that just housed the National Historic Landmark um, original house and then took us all the way into really being able to explore the artistic legacy of the house. So for those of you who have not been to the Florence Griswold Museum, um, the story of the Florence Griswold Museum is that it was originally established to honor the artistic heritage of the the site, which served as the home of the Lyme art colony at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th centuries. Florence Griswold owned the house. She was not an artist herself, uh, but she opened up a boarding house and created the opportunity for artists to come and to explore the area of old Lyme and situated right along the Lieutenant River, which is an offshoot of the Connecticut River. And so this was an opportunity for artists to come and to document the site. And as we started to look at ways that we could activate the site, which we had grown to 12 acres by the time of my arrival in uh, late 2017, early 2018, we took a lot of inspiration from the paintings. Um, we had a number of opportunities to review source materials, such as an archeological dig uh, and study that had taken place in 1995, in 1996, as well as things like his you know, house inventories to understand what was purposed, what, what was purchased in order to populate the site. But for us, the focus was not on any of the restoration of the structures, but really looking at ways that we could make use of this 12 acres in this unique environment right along the riverfront. So here, as you can see, we're looking at some um, reproductions of some of the artists who worked at the site. Willard Medcalf, Benjamin Eggleston, whose quote is included on this page, um, and Child Hassam were just some of the artists that came through and painted regularly on site. If you notice, take, you know, remember these scenes because this is really where our inspiration came from as we were looking to develop and activate the site. So the plans really began um, in earnest when we worked with um, the landscape design firm of Stimson based out of Western Massachusetts and Cambridge, Massachusetts. And as you can see here, this is an aerial view of the land um, that points out where the Florence Griswold Museum is located within the Old Lyme area, as you can see, adjacent to a historic district. Um, you know, I think it was interesting to hear some earlier comments about working within any kind of state and local designated areas. For us, we were considered the anchor of this designated area, and we were able to demonstrate a lot of flexibility as long as there was alignment um, with priorities. But because we were not part of that commercial district, which is where you see the text uh, that says Old Lyme Historic District, uh, but maintained a separate area, we were able to have a little bit more, um, as I said, nimbleness in what we were doing. But as you can see here, this shows you where the Lieutenant River is, um, that uh, stream right along with Florence Griswold Museum, and then that it connects to the Connecticut River. 
You can also see just for orientation um, that the area is cut through by Interstate 95. Um, this is probably very typical for many of you uh, who has to deal um, with infrastructural demands as you're also looking at greening opportunities. Um, and for us, this actually was not too much of a challenge. Uh, we had enough foliage on site, enough plantings that we were able to screen ourselves um, very appropriately. But um, just especially for you in, in New England, where there can be a lot of congestion, this is something that we dealt with in this idyllic location as well. So here is what we really started to look at when we were considering um, what we wanted to do to develop the site. As you can see here, we have um, kind of where the museum is going to be going in the future, which I'm really excited about. So everyone stay tuned for that, um, even though I'm no longer on site. But you can see these numbered areas and the numbered areas, as well as uh, the uh, copper colored line, dictated what we really wanted to consider our interpretive plan for the site. So we had a number of different kind of methodologies in play that were cross informing each other, I would say. One was the interpretive prioritization of the site and ways that, as you can tell with this line, we were eager to encourage visitors to go through every of the 12 acres, no longer to be just, you know, kind of hovering around the Florence Griswold house, which is at the bottom right of the screen, nor to just come in through the parking lot, which is central and explore the Creeble Gallery that dates to 2003, but really to go throughout the grounds. So that interpretive methodology was something that really influenced the um, the representatives from Stimson, and they ended up developing with us something that we called the artist trail. And the artist trail was what ultimately took this form. And these different areas are designated for different purposes, some for to be the site of earned revenue opportunities like an event space, but others that were really developed with the idea that we were going to be focusing on the ecological heritage as well as the artistic one and marrying the two. So you'll see that we had areas where we were reestablishing an orchard space, which had been there in the past until about 1920, as well as to bring in emerging wetlands and meadows that we recognized were part of the historical ecolog ecological makeup of the area, but had since fallen away as we had pretty much in the past decade since it became a museum, created just a large lawn space. So here's an example of how the museum now looks. Uh, so imagine what I just said. This was a previously a green space. It was just a mowed lawn. Um, but this area is where we have the opportunity to have that historic orchard. These are mixed fruit plantings. Um, we learned through house inventories that these were original to the area. So here you are seeing apple trees and pear trees, um, along with a couple of other varieties. And you're also seeing what we decided to do was to create an opportunity for visitors to have some kind of wayfinding that was as natural as possible. So rather than creating um, a lot of concrete paths or anything that was, um, you know, influencing negatively the visitor experience, we created these mode paths very much in the European garden tradition, so that it was guiding you through um, each of the sites, but creating an opportunity for a fully accessible but immersive visitor opportunity. This is one of my favorite spots. Um, this is what we call the boardwalk. And the boardwalk is a serpentine wooden path that goes right along the river and echoes that wonderful kind of fluid movement of the river itself. This was um, a really wonderful addition to the space because it also served um, as an opportunity to um, serve as a repository for all the rainwater that we were receiving. So it created an ecological system unto itself where it was supporting plantings along the riverbed, which had eroded over decades of use. So here we were able to encourage the visitor to stay on one solid path, not disrupt any of the plantings. And all of the plantings that you see here are native to this area of Southeastern Connecticut. Here's another area which we call the woodlawn area. And as you can see, we do have a gravel composite here, uh, but for the most part, we wanted to create, again, that natural, almost wilderness-like experience. It's very much taking away um, 
you know, any kind of negative influence of the hand of the administrator or of the architect, and rather creating something that serves to honor um, the kind of history of the space as it originally was. And here is our overlook where you could see that we had um, the opportunity for visitors to come and to sit right by the river. Uh, this was also a wonderful opportunity because again, we wanted to create as little intrusivity and obstruction to the outdoor space. So here you are seeing again, those native plantings, you are seeing trees that were restabilized by pay taking people off of um, their surrounding root structures and putting them on paths and then having the opportunity to engage with landscape. So we of course had a real mindset here that we were looking at marrying that artistic heritage and the ecological value with the visitor experience. So here, as you can see with the master plan that um, we were able to put into motion, we started with a site that was predominantly um, lawn and garden. Um, and when you had the lawn and garden, we saw that there was just the buildings, paving, and then forest that had basically been untouched. When we were able to put together the plan and to implement it, and the artist trail did open in uh, late 2019, we were able to bring in forest with a restored understory. Uh, we were able to bring in edging around the exterior of the acreage and also bring in hedgerow and meadow. And as you can see, meadow was a completely new addition at a quarter of the site. So we were very proud to see that while we were still able to have some spaces that were mediated so that they could be used for events and, and whatnot, we had created a lot more that was an homage to where we had come from. So now I'd like to switch and share a different story, which is currently in progress at my new home institution, the Taft Museum of Art in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so the Taft Museum is a completely different landscape. So I came from a site that was, uh, as I said, right along the river. We were interested in dealing with things like uh, sea level, um, you know, rise abatement. We were dealing with erosion. We were dealing with the overall landscape of a 12 acre site that belonged to the museum itself. Here at the Taft Museum, uh, don't let this image fool you. We are right in the middle of the downtown of, area of Cincinnati, and we are on about one and a half acres. So I am directly next to a, a large, uh, about 15 story building on one side. We have Red Stadium about half a mile away. So it's a very, very different landscape that we function in. But this house is the oldest extant wood frame structure in the city of Cincinnati in situ. It is a house that was also built in 1820, if you can believe it. I went from one 1820 structure to another. Um, and it was in private hands and went through a number of different families until about 1927, when the owner of that house at that time, Charles Phelps Taft and his wife, Anna Sitton Taft, decided to leave the building and their collection of fine art to the people of Cincinnati. And so for almost 100 years, this has been a museum uh, open to the public. So as you can see, you get a better sense of our environment here. Uh, this is from a 2014 installation that was done by artist Patrick Doherty. So you can see some ways that the, the grounds were activated. Um, but this is a space in which we are literally surrounded by a black wrought iron fence. And while we have an interior courtyard, which you can see behind the main facade there, that plus our lawn is the only space that we have. So we've had some different ways that we've been looking at the space, namely the fact that um, for the past eight years, there has been a citywide plan to um, review and to really uh, update this park, which is known as Lytle Square, directly in front of the museum. So we're actually across the street here. This is a view from within the park itself, looking at the Taft Museum of Art. 
so this is a park space that's actually been in progress as i said this has been ongoing for almost a decade this project but they finally broke ground in the fall of last year and the reason that i bring this up is because as a city museum that's interested in environmental sustainability and activating uh space what we've actually been able to do here is to negotiate with the city so that we are able to have more of a place for art and the historical ecology, modeling kind of my experience at the Flow Grizz, but taking it outside of the museum grounds. As you can see, this is a pretty well-developed park system. It's a city park. It is designed to have these open spaces. As you can see, there is a winding gravel pathway, uh, a fountain, um, and some pretty cultivated plantings. So I would not say that this reflects some of our priorities that we had at the Florence Griswold Museum in terms of honoring, I'd say, the native um, environment of the space but also gives us the opportunity to work in a completely different model in an urban environment. So while we have the opportunity to activate our space to a certain extent, we're also using this as an opportunity to model collaboration with municipal interests. So here is what we are, had originally been looking at, but it gives us the opportunity to work more on what we can do. As you can see, this is already better than what we already had. This was an earlier mock-up, which as you can see, did not have much of the green space at all. So we've made some progress, but we have a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that we are honoring the history of the site as well. So I guess what I just want to offer in my experience of overseeing a successful program at the Florence Griswold Museum and now navigating a program of environmental sustainability and interest in historical ecology at the Taft Museum of Art is that the priority that we work with is honoring the integrity of place. So we see this as mission direct, and that is one of the um, tools that we use as we are looking at working with those who may be collaborators and actors in the in the space outside of the museum. So we really want to emphasize that when we talk about honoring our site and our institution, we're looking at the architectural heritage, we're looking at the artistic heritage of the collection, and we're also looking at the ways that these grounds were developed around us at the city and ways that we can help people understand that development. The second is to find partners that represent a variety of interests. So here we actually have a seat at the table, not because we're across the street, the Taft Museum was never invited to have a say, and that's why we're playing a little bit of catch up in terms of the design elements right now. At the same time, we have corporate interests, believe it or not, <laughs> that are actually supporting our um, involvement in the project uh, through board members who are involved at the sea level with the um, corporate interests that are really funding a lot of the development in this area of town. We're able to work with them to actually get their support for an artistic and an ecological um, on behalf of the Taft. I'd say the next thing that I would recommend is to advocate for the importance of artistic and cultural representation at all levels. When other people see a public park, they may see a mowed lawn space, they may see benches, and they may see a couple of trees. For our interests, what we're trying to do is to use the resources available to us in terms of historical imagery, um, in terms of our archives, and in terms of photographs to help influence some of those decisions at the city level so that they maintain some degree of connectivity with the past, both the development of Cincinnati, its arts heritage, as well as its environment. And then also what we try to do is to position ourselves not as a hammer that is setting boundaries or coming down on any of these potential collaborators, but to really position ourselves as a partner. Um, sometimes we're not going to win every battle, but as we all know, when we were hearing about in the earlier presentation, when especially when you're working with an environment um, where there's a lot of exposure in terms of historic preservation and designations, you may be dealing with a lot of regulations. 
for us dealing with a public park space, we're not dealing with historic uh, preservation regulations because there's no designation across the street. There's only a designation here. So we like to position that as an opportunity to be able to do new things to honor the ecological history of the site versus what we may be bound to across the street here. So there's an opportunity to leverage that relationship and also to leverage the messaging so that you're not creating unnecessary unnecessary limitations, but you are rather um, investing in the project and finding a conjoined focus. So I believe that that's all I have right there. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn it back over to Julie um, to field questions that may come up. Thank you, Becky, great projects. So we have had a number of questions that have popped up um, for Daniel and Michael. Um, one of the questions was about how tax credits work considering the nonprofit status. Um, you know, we, we tend to think of ourselves as being tax-free. That's not always actually the case, <laughs> especially in projects like this. I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, the, uh, the, the state of Louisiana allows for state historic tax credits on those restorations. Um, and uh, it, the program initially did not. I don't remember what was the um, project that challenged the uh, situation, but that was back uh, probably I would say around 2011. And so certainly I'll tell you that, uh, you know, allowing nonprofits to uh, do renovations and get historic tax credits is important. The state of Louisiana is generally not a wealthy state. And so the resources, wherever they come from, I think the state is appreciative of them. Um, uh, we cannot use the tax credits, but we can monetize the tax credits uh, by selling them to those who can. And uh, that's the second half of the puzzle for the state of Louisiana is that the, um, there are industries that um, rely very heavily on trying to find and purchase those tax credits for their tax returns. Uh, and so, you know, we used a broker for that. Um, we used a broker for the project before that. Uh, we will use the same broker for this project. Um, now, you know, the federal tax credits, uh, are we are not allowed to use those. Uh, they're not, we can't monetize them and uh, the federal government will allow for it. Although the standards that state uses for a historic preservation are almost exactly the same. So we still get the same bang for the buck with respect to what we're doing to the buildings. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. I think a lot of people may not have known that that was an option that was out there for these big projects if they haven't gone through it before. Becky, when you were working um, at Florence Griswold with some of the pathways and things, we had a question that popped up about um, how ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, and, and how that was when you're looking at um, compliance, you know, was the boardwalk um, an area that had any concern for anyone? That was one of the questions that's popped up. Yeah, so that was something that we looked at really carefully. As we were initiating the project, a lot of what we did was actually kind of not visible in the end result, but regrading throughout the grounds so that everything was within ADA compliance. Um, so we actually took that as a huge priority in making sure that the grounds were fully accessible to anyone and everyone that was visiting us. I will share an anecdote that on the day that we had the ribbon cutting, the um, architects, the landscape architects from Stimson were there with their three-year-old daughter who um, got a little rambunctious on the boardwalk and fell right off. <laughs> and in, in view of five of our board members who started freaking out immediately. Um, so we definitely had to do uh, some study at that point to you know, affirm that not only was this ADA compliant, but it was safe. So we brought in some references from other nature museums and conservancies around the area to show, you know, we, we can't necessarily solve every issue or anticipate every hiccup as we open, 
grounds up to everyone. Um, but at the same time, I think that we were able to quell a lot of those concerns. Another thing that we did with compliance is we also, um, to avoid any risk exposure, made sure that the first thing we did before it was open to the public was to update all of our insurance. If you are in a site that has typically been you know, incorporating a visitor experience only to a certain point, and then you're really expanding expanding that visitor experience, bring in your insurance reps to take a look at everything. Because at the very least, if you disclose what that guest experience will be like, God forbid, if we had had any issues with any injuries from something like the boardwalk, we would have had that opportunity to prepare accordingly. Um, but we didn't. And, you know, so we just asked that the two and three-year-olds you know, maybe have some good parental oversight. But as I will also say that as the plantings have grown, uh, now we have um, a lot of coverage and it's very lush. So that also helps. But yes, long answer to an easy question, full <laughs> ADA compliance there. No, thank you. Um, and it, it turned out beautiful, really, really beautiful. Uh, back, back on the other side with Daniel and Michael, um, this is such, you know, kind of a, a basic one, but you are in such a landlocked area um, in the corner. Where did everyone park? Where were all of your construction, your trucks? Where, you know, where, where were you shoehorning all of these vehicles in? So you, you all will recall that I said that we had a garage that we took part of it to put the electrical service into. Um, so we have that garage before we um, began the project, have about 145 parking spaces in it. So uh, the GC, uh, as well as the architects and other subs, they took up space in there for offices, but there was still space for uh, parking, for staging. And um, I, I'll be honest, at first I thought that we would, you know, we, oh, we can just use like the back half of the garage, but it was like within weeks you realize, no. No, that's not the case. Now, we also have, uh, we don't have, but there's a parking lot just behind our garage that people could park in as well. And that's hundreds of spots. But, you know, for for um, for subs and for construction folks, uh, you know, we try to keep them inside the garage and keep, it, uh, keep the interference with our neighbors down as much as possible. What was the total time frame for the projects? Well, Daniel mentioned we started in 2014. Um, which is for planning, yes. And we, uh, but we took approximately thirty-six months for the full construction. We opened in April of two thousand nineteen. So, and there's no doubt that the re restrictions and complications of the French Quarter held us up in a time frame. It could have been done maybe less, definitely less, but I don't know how much less. So, you know, we we're kind of mentally prepared for that for each project. Um, I'll just add that that's. Um... You know, the access to the site is a huge issue. Our, our upcoming project and our original buildings will not have the advantages that our previous project had. And, you know, I don't know that we yet really understand the implications that that has on both budget and schedule for the project, uh, because there will be solutions that will need to be found for access to the site, uh, both for workers as well as for equipment. Another um, interesting thing relating to um, uh, the uh, paramount importance of um, um, preparing for a changing environment as you pursue historic preservation in, you know, in a historic district like the French Quarter is that one of the things that caused some significant delays in the restoration of the Signore Brulatour House was the height of the river uh, because the um, site is um, within 1,600 feet of the river. It falls under... Um, restrictions that the Army Corps of Engineers puts in place when the river reaches a certain uh, stage, flood stage level. And the that the time period in the calendar year that when the river is at that height is extending. It's, it's not what it used to be. It's growing longer and longer. And we actually had impacts on our construction schedule as a result of that because um, we had to drill uh, foundation um, uh, pilings for the new construction. Uh, but they weren't able to do that while these restrictions were in place from the Corps of Engineers. Uh, were there any additional storm or hurricane protections that layered on top of all of your other regulations and requirements because of where you are? Yeah, well, you know, uh, 
uh, life safety is priority number one on any major construction project. And certainly uh, that is top of mind um, all the time, but particularly during hurricane season, uh, the site has to always be in a state of, um, of pre prepared preparation to be prepared for a evacuation situation. So, you know, you really have to have a construction team that is uh, on top of that so that when you are in a evacuation or hurricane preparedness situation, you can batten down the hatches without having to figure out how to do it as you go uh, or um, not have a run out of time. Frankly, you know, another reality of our world these days is that the timeline for uh, pre pre preparation for tropical weather events is, is shortening. Uh, things blow up very quickly now. We've experienced the past few years in the Gulf and you can go from a situation where you're not sure if you're going to be affected to being in um, in the cone of air for a, a major hurricane within you know within 24 hours. Um, yeah. I just want to add to that from a construction perspective, uh, the roof on the new building, uh, the roof on the garage, uh, they both uh, had to meet VCC requirements, but exceeded code by our requirements, uh, and so did I think you see the picture of the new museum uh, the wall is um, glass it's in the courtyard and all of that glass um, is meets Florida hurricane wind standards not Louisiana so we, you know we took it one step further in both of those cases to do just what Daniel's talking about well I'm uh I've learned a lot thank you all for coming out I know we're running a couple minutes over but um it's been great to hear, you know, different perspectives in different parts of the country and different takes at what greening means. Um, thank you for coming out. Um, I think it's going to be an easy answer, but one final question, um, Michael and Daniel, was the cost of the lead worth it? You know, a lot of places kind of go through the motions and try to do as much as possible, but the cost of actually going through the certification maybe prevents them from doing it. Was it worth it? Um, I have a I have a response to this, uh, and it is yes, it was worth it because it's been a very powerful tool for us to be able to communicate what our priorities are. Uh, will it be worth it every time? Um, I don't know. Will it matter if it isn't possible? I don't think so. I think in the end, with projects like this, you know, institutions like ours, cultural institutions in general, are. Uh, probably on the cutting edge of what needs to be done in our society in terms of both cultural preservation and uh, environmental sustainability and preservation. You know, these are the things that really underpin our missions. And so I think that um, fidelity to those missions is the key ingredient to a successful project. And if we can really commit as an organization to being sustainable and preserving the history and culture of our and stewarding the history and culture of our region will achieve great things. And so in the future, you know, if we're unable to achieve lead certification, you know, and Michael made this point earlier, we can still do the, we can still build a sustainable building. And so the certification process is just a tool. It's really a communication tool for sharing with the world, you know, that we subscribe to these values and there is definitely a value to that because it makes the job of communicating it a lot easier. But yeah, you're right. You know, it, it does carry costs and uh, sometimes um, it might not be attainable, but that shouldn't be uh, dissuasive. And I, and I agree. I think that, you know, if you look at the dollars, it's easy to say no. But the truth is that it's beyond just the financial analysis of whether you're going to do lead or not. And it, the lessons we've learned, the contributions it's made to the project and to our future, our knowledge for the future is, I think, worth it in every way. And I, neither one of us mentioned this. We are the only lead certified building in the French Quarter. So that's also not enough to say, yes, do it. But it's it's a layer. There's no yeah. doubt it. I right. think we're very proud of that. That's right. And that's an indication that our field, the historic preservation field, has a lot of progress to make in terms of aligning itself with sustainability. Uh, the reality is, is that historic preservation, as it has been practiced for a long time, has not always been aligned with sustainable with sustainability. 
Um, and you know, we need to we need to work. There's a transition underway right now in that respect, and that's something that um, I think is is a difficult nut to crack. And the LEED certification helps with that. But even more important is the partnerships with groups in the community. You know, we have some wonderful preservation organizations here in New Orleans, uh, like our friends at the Preservation Resource Center, who really are join us in explaining to the public that historic preservation and sustainability need to be conceived of as being of a piece with one another. Well, and I know I've sat through lectures that Becky has given on sustainability is also financial sustainability. <laughs> so it's yeah. it's a broad a broad concept, and and we need it across the board at all of our sites um, to keep to keep them going for for the future. Well, I, I know that Kate put in the chat to everyone um, the Earth Month flyers. So make sure to join us for the next few weeks. We have a really great lineup of speakers that are coming out. Thank you to the Environment and Climate Network um, for pulling this together and for the Historic House and Site Network um, for letting us be a part of this. Um, we're really excited to share it with both of our networks and all of you. So thank you, the three of you, for coming out and sharing all this information with us today. Thank you. Thank you.